civilization. For several thousands of years it has slowly advanced across our world, consuming the once seemingly endless wilderness and bringing into domestication every corner of the earth. The one constant denominator for this grand historical march of civilization is expansion. It is the hallmark of civilization to grow, to tread down, to subjugate the world around it. Such has been its appetite since it first crawled out of the cradle. But what happens when civilization reaches a point where there is nowhere left to expand? What if the world has an end? What if the scriptures are true? And what if we are now fast approaching the end of the world? Around 2,000 years ago, an event happened that would change the history of our world forever. A Jewish man of impoverished birth who would eventually grow up to live as a homeless wanderer in the Judean countryside of the Middle East, having neither great political stature nor financial wealth, began to preach a message that would eventually transform and ultimately conquer the greatest empire that the world had known up to that point in time. That empire, of course, was the Roman Empire, and that man, of course, was Jesus of Nazareth. And although he was indeed born into this world as a man, he was also much more than that. He was, he is, the creator of all things, the only begotten Son of the Heavenly Father and God incarnate. And he is also the Messiah, the Christ who has come into this world in the flesh. It is that last title of Messiah that I wish to focus on for a moment. In our modern vernacular, the word Messiah can have different connotations and meanings to different people. A charismatic religious figure, a savior who rescues us from our sins or some otherwise hopeless situation, a chosen one, a special person selected by God to reveal great mysteries and shed light on hidden truths and meanings to a confused and chaotic world. But both the Hebrew word Mashiach, from which we derive the term Messiah, and its Greek counterpart Christos, from which we get the word Christ, share a similar meaning of something or someone that is anointed with oil for a specific purpose. The Messiah has a very specific role and connotation. The Messiah refers to one specific person who is anointed with oil to become king, but not just any king. The Messiah is anointed to be king of the world entire. Let's travel back in time for a moment to the year 66 AD. The Jewish nation is about to embark on a course of disaster. They're about to rise up in revolt against the Roman Empire, the most powerful empire on the planet at the time. And that empire would eventually come in and crush the Jewish nation, destroy their temple and their capital of Jerusalem, and ultimately, in a matter of years, decimate the remaining Jews in the land of Judea. They would then be sold into slavery or scattered throughout the known world, only to return almost 2,000 years later in the 20th century. So what compelled the Jews to rise up against the most powerful empire on the planet? To understand the reasons behind the Jewish revolt that began in 66 AD, we need to look at the writings of the historian Josephus. Josephus lists many reasons why the Jewish revolt began. However, there is one reason that he lists as the reason above all others, a Messiah. In his book, The War of the Jews, he writes, but what more than all else incited them to the war was an ambiguous oracle also found in their sacred writings that, at about that time, one from their country would become ruler of the habitable world. So Josephus, who was an eyewitness himself to the entire revolt, stated that the main reason for the cause of the war was the belief that the Messiah was about to return in their day and age. The Messiah would be one of their people, and he would become king of the whole world. But where did the Jews get this belief that a Messiah would rise up out of their people at that day and age to become king of the world? Well, according to Josephus, he said that it was an ambiguous prophet or oracle found in their sacred writings or scriptures. I believe that the prophet that Josephus is referring to is none other than the prophet Daniel found in the Bible. There are two key elements in the writings of the book of Daniel that would suggest that this is the prophet Josephus was referring to. One, 
Daniel talks about the Messianic era, about the coming of the Messiah who would be king of the entire world. And two, more importantly, Daniel gives a time frame for when these events would occur. Let's turn now to Daniel chapter 7. In verse 13, Daniel writes, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. We further read in verse 27, And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and the dominions shall serve and obey him. Now these verses in the book of Daniel chapter 7 are clearly messianic verses. And they indicate a future coming king that would have an everlasting kingdom which all dominions or all kingdoms of the world entire would obey. In 66 AD, when the Jews of that day were reading these verses, they would have understood the reference to the people of the saints of the Most High as the Jews or the Jewish people. So here we can see why the Jews of 66 AD believed that a world ruler would rise from their people. But we still have to determine why they believed it would happen in their day and age. For that, we need to look at Daniel chapter 9. Beginning in verse 24, we read, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Now what are these 70 weeks that are being referred to? You see, in ancient times, the nation of Israel was supposed to work their land or farm their field for a period of six years, and then on a seventh year, let the land rest as a form of crop rotation. This was commanded to them in their sacred writings or the Torah. However, after a certain period of time in ancient Israel, the Jewish nation began to fall into a state of sin, and they began to forego the commandments that were given to them in the Torah, including keeping the sabbatical years. Because of this, and because of other sins, God led that nation in that day and age into captivity and into slavery and bondage in a land called Babylon around 500 years before Christ. They served the king of Babylon as slaves for a period of 70 years, and then at the end of that 70 years, they were allowed to return home again to rebuild their destroyed temple and capital in the city of Jerusalem. Daniel was one of those captives that was taken into Babylon. And so Daniel is writing chapter 9 at the end of that captivity, shortly before the Jews are allowed to rebuild their temple. So therefore, when Daniel is referring to 70 weeks, what he's referring to is 70 sets of 7 years. The actual word in Hebrew means sevens, not weeks, as it's rendered in English. Now that we know that the 70 weeks referred to here are actually a period of 490 years, we can then move forward with the rest of the prophecy. In verse 25 we read, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So what is the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem? Well, again, Daniel was a member of the captives who were waiting in Babylon for a chance to return to their homeland in order to rebuild their destroyed capital of Jerusalem and their temple, which was burned to the ground by the Babylonians at the beginning of their captivity. All of this was taking place several centuries before the Jewish revolt in 70 AD.
Now, most of chapter 9 of the book of Daniel is about Daniel reciting a prayer of repentance at the end of the 70-year Babylonian captivity, shortly before the return to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Daniel is reciting this prayer after having read Holy Scriptures showing that the captivity would end at the end of 70 years. Daniel also lists in verse 1 of chapter 9 the year in which this is all taking place. It states in verse 1, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. So from this, we know what year this chapter is being written. As Daniel is reciting his prayer of repentance, suddenly an angel, Gabriel, appears on the scene. In verse 21 we read, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me, and talked with me, and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee that thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter, and consider the vision. So the commandment that was given to rebuild or restore the city of Jerusalem and the temple was granted at the beginning of Daniel's prayer. Daniel's prayer starts in verse 1 of chapter 9 in the first year of Darius, son of Ahasuerus. I believe this is Darius II. To understand a little bit of the history, Darius II was in a struggle for power around the year 423 BC. It took him a couple of years to consolidate the power of the kingdom. However, the year 423 would have been the first year in which he came to power. This is not what is referred to when it says the first year of Darius II, however, because the first year of a king is always known as the accession year. After that, the first full year that a king is in power is considered the first year. So therefore, the first year of Darius II would run from the spring of 422 to the spring of 421 BC. It's also important to note that in ancient times the new year began in the spring. So therefore, if we count ahead 490 years from the year 422 or 421, that brings us to about the year 69 or 70 AD, which is the time of the destruction of the temple. So now we can understand why the Jews of 66 AD were expecting the Messiah to arrive in their time frame. Unfortunately, they confused or misinterpreted the prophecy to believe that the Messiah would arrive during the time of the Jewish revolt, which took place from the years 66 to about 74 AD, during which the temple was destroyed in the year 70 AD. That generation failed to recognize the true Messiah. It's also important to note that the 70 weeks prophecy doesn't actually say that the Messiah will arrive at that time frame. Now I will go into a more detailed explanation of what the 70 weeks prophecy actually says in another video. However, because of the complexity involved, I'm going to forego that in this video and move on to the next topic. If you want to find out more about the 70 week prophecy, there will be a link provided that you can click on in order to see my interpretation of that prophecy and why Jesus Christ is the actual Messiah. The one important thing that I want to point out from these prophecies in Daniel, however, is that it did accurately predict that the temple in Jerusalem will be destroyed in the year 70 AD. It gave the exact year that the temple would be destroyed, and did so centuries before it happened. Therefore, since we know that Bible prophecy has accurately predicted events in the past with amazing accuracy, we know we can rely upon it for prophecy about the future apocalypse and the coming end of the world. But before we continue to talk about the end of the world, Let's now take a look at the beginning.
You're probably familiar with the symbol of a Jesus fish, which is found on the back of many Christian bumper stickers. However, you may not realize some of the origins or meanings behind this particular symbol. The symbol itself can be formed from two concentric circles, which overlap at the midway point, forming what's known as a vesica Pisces. The Jesus fish is the center part of those two circles. If you take a compass and draw a circle on a piece of paper, and then take that same compass and move the point to anywhere along the perimeter of the circle and draw another circle, you'll form a vesica Pisces. You'll also form two new points where the two circles intersect. If you then continue to take that compass and place it on each consecutive point, you'll eventually complete a full circuit of circles forming a symbol known as the Flower of Life. The Flower of Life is an ancient symbol, but it completes a circle of circles. Now once you form the Flower of Life by drawing these circles, you'll have completed a total of seven concentric circles to form one great circle. That corresponds, interestingly, to the number of days in creation. There are six days of creation according to the book of Genesis, and the seventh final day of rest. Now in Genesis chapter 1, the order of creation for the six days are as follows. On day 1, God creates light and he separates the light from the darkness. On day 2, God creates the sky and separates the water or clouds above from the water or oceans below. On day 3, God lets the oceans below gather into one place and lets dry land appear. On day four, God creates the sun, the moon, and the stars. On day five, God creates the fishes and the birds. On day six, God creates animals and man. And then their final seventh day is a day of completion of rest. It completes the entire cycle and God stops his work. Now, what's very interesting is that if you notice the order of creation, each item in the first three days create a realm that is filled by their counterpart in the next three days. For example, on day one, God creates light. But on day four, God creates the sun, the moon, and the stars to rule over the light. On day two, God creates the sky and the waters which are below and above. But its opposite day, day five, God creates the birds which fill the sky and the fishes which fill the sea. On day three, God creates land, but on day six, God creates the animals and men that fill the land. So as we can see, there's some amazing mathematical symmetry embedded in the text in Genesis chapter one. This is far more than just some ancient shepherd's mythological tale that was passed down from generation to generation. There is some amazing design behind the text that shows it was inspired and written by God. This mathematical symmetry is embedded in the very fabric of our reality. For example, notice in the rays of sunlight you have the same six rays that are formed in the flower of life. You can also see it in things like snowflakes. What's also amazing is that the points will connect to form something called Metatron's Cube, a three-dimensional object rendered on two dimensions. And again, this is something that draws itself simply by following the mathematics. It's amazing to think that embedded in the very fabric of our universe is something that speaks to us that conveys subject matter to us in an intelligent way. This same six-pointed symmetry is found in symbols such as the Star of David from the very nation that gave us the scriptures and the Bible. If we compare Genesis 1 to Genesis chapter 2, we notice that there are different orders or items of creation. However, upon closer examination, what we find is that these two chapters also form a symmetry. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, everything that's created is created in a sense of wilderness, of filling the world entire. On Genesis chapter 2, we see God planting a garden, something that's domestic rather than wild. 
in addition to that, everything that's in the garden in Hebrew is referring to animals that are domestic animals or crops or plants that are domestic plants. What we see in Genesis chapter 2 is the name of God changes from a generic term for God to the term Lord God, indicating authority and structure or domestication as opposed to wilderness. Man is referred to a man that tills the soil. In other words, a farmer. Again, speaking of domestication as opposed to, say, a hunter-gatherer in Genesis chapter 1. So therefore, symmetry plays a part throughout the entire Bible. Even in the very beginning, the very first verse shows symmetry. It says that God created the heavens and the earth. It's comparing and contrasting two separate items. It's pairing them together. When we read the Bible throughout, we see this theme of pairing or contrasting two different things from the very beginning of the Bible all the way to the end, showing it was written by one author, that author being the Holy Spirit. Even Jesus himself spoke in parables, pairing and contrasting one item to another item. This is a very common theme that is held throughout the Bible. Now in Proverbs chapter 8, beginning in verse 22, we find some interesting verses that have to do with the creation of the world. In this chapter, wisdom, or the Spirit of God, is personified as a woman or a uh, virtuous wife. And it's showing an anthropomorphization, uh, an analogy of God possessing wisdom at the beginning of his creation of the world. And in that, we read, starting in verse 22, it says, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that his water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable parts, habitable parts of the earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. The important thing I want to focus on here is verse 27, where it states, When he prepared the heavens, I was there, when he set a compass upon the face of the depth. A compass, of course, is a tool for drawing circles. And as we can see earlier, there is geometric symmetry embedded in creation. Now there's another important verse in the Bible that states that to the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. The reason why this is important is because there are messianic prophecies in the Bible that indicate that Jesus would come as Messiah or King of the world for a thousand year reign on earth of peace. That thousand year reign is going to happen very soon. So we can see another symmetry or pairing in this concept of a day being a thousand years. In the Bible, Man was commanded to keep a six-day work week and then rest on a seventh day. If the day is as a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is as a day, and Jesus is coming back for a thousand years of peace, then one could make the analogy that there would be a thousand years of earth history of turmoil and trouble before the thousand-year reign of peace, the sabbatical millennium, which Jesus comes to rule on. If we look at the chronology of the Bible and add up the dates in, we'll note that we are very, very close to that 6,000 year period. However, before Christ returns, there are a number of prophecies that have to come to pass. For one thing, an Antichrist has to appear on the scene. If there's going to be a Messiah or a world ruler in the form of Jesus Christ, there will first be an Antichrist who will try to claim that title to King of the World. His kingdom will be very short-lived, however, but it will be a time of absolute trouble and turmoil on earth, known as the Apocalypse. After that time, Jesus Christ comes to return and redeem his people and start his thousand-year reign on earth. 
Now that time is very, very short. In order to understand when that might be, it's important that we look at Bible chronology. And that's the next part that we're going to examine in this video. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, we have an interesting statement about the creation of man at the beginning of the world by God. In verse 26 we read, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So therefore, when God created Adam, he created him in his image, but he also instilled in Adam authority over the whole planet. Adam was, in fact, the king of the world. Now that kingship would pass on to one of Adam's descendants as an heir to the throne. However, in ancient times, the kingship normally passed on to the oldest male son of the king. This is not always the line of succession, however, though. Sometimes the line of succession would go to another heir if the older heir was disqualified or if the king were to select someone else as the heir. In the case of Adam, his son Cain killed his second oldest son Abel and was disqualified from being heir to the title king of the world. He was cast out, sent to wander the planet, and eventually his descendants would die in the flood. However, God gave Adam a third son named Seth and the title king over all the earth would have passed down through Seth to his sons and so on and so forth. What we have now is a game of thrones, a line of succession down to one individual in history that has the title king over all the earth. This is king of kings. Only one person can claim this title. Now as we go through the Bible, we can trace this messianic line to see which individuals this kingship would fall upon. Eventually, it lands squarely upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ. He is the true heir to the title King of Kings and King over all the earth. He is the Messiah. Now Jesus ascended into heaven after his death. He is alive at this very day. And he will one day come again to take his throne as king of the world. So therefore, Jesus being the true Messiah, one who will never die, is the only person that can have that title king of the world. The kingship falls squarely upon him and he is an everlasting king. But in order to figure out when exactly he will return and establish his kingdom, we need to take a closer look at Bible chronology. Now you can take a Bible and sit down and try to figure out the chronology of the history of the world according to the Bible. I've actually done this, and the spreadsheet is very long, very lengthy, and very detailed. However, I'm going to spare you that information in this video. There will be another video you can look at of mine that will explain this chronology in more detail. But for the purposes of this video, I'm going to go over some specific single items that can give you a good approximation of how we come up with the age of the earth. Now I'm going to go over this list very quickly for the sake of time. However, if you have an interest in Bible chronology, please check out some of my other videos that will explain these figures in greater detail. Suffice to say, there are three particular items that you need to know in order to establish proper Bible chronology. The list in black includes some benchmarks that you can use in order to calculate the creation of the world, although my chronology in my other video will go into great, much, much greater detail. But the items in red are some of the adjustments that need to be made. There are three that stand out in particular. One is that the calculation of the time that the Israelites were in Egypt must be 300 years. I explain this and why it is in my other chronology video. A second is that I believe that Abraham was the third born son, not the first born. So we add about two years to the chronology overall because of that. And again, I explain why I believe this is in, a, in my other video. The other item we have to add is there is a patriarch by the name of Canaan that was born after the flood that's listed in the genealogy of Jesus and in the Septuagint, but not listed in the Old Testament. 
There may be various reasons why it's not listed in the Old Testament, such as verses that state that certain individuals will be blotted out from the book of life for certain sins. However, for whatever reason it is, we are going to include that because he is listed in the New Testament in the genealogy of Jesus. In order to come up with the age that we must add for Canaan from the time that he was born till the birth of his firstborn son, we have to look at a text called the Septuagint. In the Septuagint, that's listed as 130 years, but the Septuagint seems to add about 100 years to most of those birth dates. So therefore, we're going to use 30 years because that's what it would have been most likely had it appeared in the Old Testament. The last thing I want to point out is that the year of creation is 3967 BC, but the new year starts in spring. I have the date of creation about a week before the new year, so we should actually use roughly the 3968 BC as our start point if we're going to calculate other figures. But suffice to say, I place the creation of the world on April 3rd, 3967 BC. Having said that, let's move on to the next part of our video where we'll take a look at some amazing Bible astronomy. Now before I go into this part of the video, it's very important that I make a distinction between astronomy and astrology. Astrology, according to the Bible, is a sin. Astrology is a sort of divination or sorcery, where you begin to ascribe events to the stars as having certain control over your lives, and you begin to actually worship the stars. This is definitely a sin. That is not what Bible astronomy is. Bible astronomy treats the stars as nothing more than a clock. A clock given by God in order to convey information to us about his times, seasons, days, and years. And it states in the fourth day of creation in Genesis chapter 1 that th that is exactly why the stars were placed in the heavens. They're placed there for signs and seasons or appointed times, days, and years. And so God uses the stars as a mechanism for timekeeping. He uses it as his great clock. So having said that, we wouldn't worship a clock if it happens to foretell when an event happens. We wouldn't say, for example, talk to a friend and tell them that you meet them at 1 o'clock the next day, and then once we show up at 1 o'clock, worship the clock because it predicted the future. No, rather we understand that the clock is nothing more than a tool for telling time. That's the same way the stars are. We don't worship the stars, but we do recognize that God placed information embedded in the stars. In fact, the Bible says his gospel is in the stars. So now having said that, let's take a look at the days of creation according to the stars. Now as I mentioned earlier, I have a start date of creation as April 3rd, 3967 BC. How I arrived at that is simple. By going through the Bible and adding up all the years to come up listed, to come up with my Bible chronology, I arrived at the year 3967. New Year in ancient times starts in the spring. It starts when the moon begins to go through its new phase. So if we go back seven days from the new year, we arrive at the date of creation, because it took seven days for God to create the world with one day of rest. So if we go back seven days from the ancient new year of 3967 BC, what we see is the moon is in the constellation of Aquarius, and it's exactly at half phase. It's half light and half dark. On day one of creation, God said, let there be light, and he separated the light from the darkness. In addition to that, the moon is in a constellation that depicts a man carrying a wooden beam on his shoulder and pouring out water. Jesus carried a cross on his shoulder, and he poured out water and blood when he was pierced by the soldier when he died. The exact moment that this moon is in this phase, in this constellation, is the exact hour that Jesus died, according to the Bible, 4,000 years to the day. That's absolutely amazing when you consider that I arrived at this imagery simply by adding up the dates in the Bible to come up with my Bible chronology. But let's move ahead. If this is day one of creation, what do we see on day seven of creation when God finally completes the world and rests? On day seven of creation, we have the new year in ancient times in the year 3967. At exactly the start of dawn on that new year day, we have the moon precisely passing over the sun to start its new phase just as it comes up above the horizon. 
So the moon is beginning the exact start of the first day of the month at the very minute and second that the sun is beginning the, the seventh day. This is amazing, but there's more than that as well. We also notice that the stars are in perfect alignment and synchronicity for conveying amazing information in the heavens at this time. For example, the sun is directly in the center of the constellation of Taurus. The moon is directly aligned with the sun at this point in time. Four of the planets out of the five visible planets of ancient times are all in the constellation of Taurus. The two planets that circle the sun, Mercury and Venus, give the length of the constellations. The two inner planets are exactly seven days apart from being conjoined with the sun, going forwards or backwards. It creates a perfect example of the sun being bisected by the four stars at the exact length of the constellation of Taurus. This alludes to the amazing symmetry that I talked about earlier when we're talking about the geometry of creation. The Bible is based on symmetry and our world and the heavens are based on symmetry as well. This is the start of God's clock. What we also find is that Saturn is at the opposite end of the zodiac than the Sun. Just as the Sun is rising, Saturn is setting. So Saturn, unlike all the other planets which are in perfect alignment, is set completely at the opposite end and apart from all the other planets. Now the word Saturday comes from the word Saturn. It also is where we get the word Sabbath. It means the number seven, or the seventh day, the day of rest. The day that's set apart from all the other days. So we see in the heavens an example of the Sabbath being placed in the imagery of, of God's astronomy. What's also absolutely amazing is that if we go exactly 4,000 years from the first day of creation, as mentioned earlier, to the crucifixion of Christ, we notice that the moon is a blood moon. Again, this blood moon is occurring exactly 4,000 years after the day of creation. Now there's another interesting verse in the Bible that's a messianic prophecy, and this occurs in the book of Numbers. In it, an uh, individual by the name of Balaam is giving a prophecy about the future coming Messiah. In verse 17 of chapter 24 of the book of Numbers, we read, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. So this is an amazing messianic prophecy that we see in the book of Numbers. But it actually alludes to the star of Bethlehem, and I'll show you why in a moment. You see, in the Bible it states that the, the wise men came when they saw the star of Bethlehem to Jerusalem because they believed that the Messiah had now arrived. They knew this because of the ancient prophecy of Balaam that I just read. We're going to look at that particular sign in the heavens right now. What we see is a conjunction of stars forming what looks like a scepter. And if you were standing in Jerusalem in that day and age, it would have occurred slightly to the northeast, mostly to the east. That area on the map is what's known as the corner of Moab. So we have a scepter rising out of the east, striking the corner of Moab. In addition to that, we see a star that occurs right where the constellation of Orion is grabbing one of the feet of the twins of Gemini. This is an allusion to a man grabbing an ankle, which is the name for Jacob. It means the one who grabs the heel. So therefore, what we see is that a star is rising out of Jacob, and a scepter is rising out of Israel that strikes the corner of Moab. This, then, is the very sign that the wise men were looking for to know that the time of the Messiah was about to come and that he was about to be born. That is the star of Bethlehem. However, according to the Bible, that star occurred twice. It occurred two years apart because when the wise men arrived in Israel, they saw the star again and they went to try and greet the Messiah, but they first went to King Herod who, who told them to come back and inform him 
when they found the Messiah. However, they were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, and Herod eventually came down and killed all the children who were two years old and younger, telling us that the time between the first appearance of the star and the second appearance of the star is two years. So because of that, we can see on the screen now the second appearance of the star of Bethlehem. In the second appearance of the star of Bethlehem, we see again a conjunction of the same stars from two years earlier, only this time the star Saturn has now moved in the sky over where Bethlehem would appear had they been traveling at that time in that countryside. The star of Saturn moves in the sky over Bethlehem at the time that dawn occurs, meaning the star stopped just as it reached over the city of Bethlehem. So here we see the actual star of Bethlehem as it occurred in ancient times. The years for this are the years 2 BC and 1 AD, meaning that Jesus Christ was born sometime around 2 BC or 1 AD. Now in September, roughly around September 3rd of 2 BC, we see some other amazing imagery in the heavens. We see in the constellation Virgo, the sun has arrived in that constellation. The sun travels one constellation every month. In addition to that, the moon is at our feet just below that constellation in Libra. At our head is the constellation Leo, which normally has nine stars, but because of three additional planets that show up in the scene, it now has 12 stars. So what we see is an image of a woman with 12 stars in her head, clothed with the sun and the moon at her feet, and she's about to give birth. This image in the heavens occurs only eight days after the appearance of the star of Bethlehem. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. Therefore, the most likely date for the birth of Jesus was around the time of August 26, 2 BC. This means that he would have been 33 years old at the time of his crucifixion, April 3rd, 33 AD, which again is exactly 4,000 years after the date of the creation of the world. Another amazing thing is that that same constellation or sign in the heavens of the woman clothed with the sun and a crown of 12 stars in her head and a moon at her feet appears at the time of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. This sign is actually a very rare sign to see. In many instances, it doesn't appear for centuries and centuries at a time. The next time it will appear is actually in the year 2017, towards the end of September. But notice some of the imagery here. Again, we have a woman with 12 stars on her head, clothed with the sun, the moon is at her feet, and below that is a man with a serpent waiting for the woman to give birth. She gives birth to a man who will have an, a rod of iron that will rule the world. Now let's read the book of Revelation, chapter 12, starting in verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried and travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth the man-child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God, and unto his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her for a thousand two hundred and threescore days. All of the imagery you're seeing here occurred in the book of Revelation and also occurred in the heavens at the time of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. This type of imagery will occur again in our very near future. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Christ is coming back next year. This does occur a few times in history. But it does call into question, because we are approaching the year 6000 so quickly, that is this a major event 
for our timeline. Now before I end this video, there is one last item that I want to talk about. And that is the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was taken into captivity three times throughout its history. The first time it was in bondage in Egypt. The second time it was in bondage in Babylon. And the third time, after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, it was in bondage to the Roman Empire. What's interesting is that each of those three nations were one of the sons of the three sons of Noah. Egypt was a descendant of the line of Ham. Babylon was a descendant of the line of Shem. And the Roman Empire was a descendant of the line of Japheth. Though the nation of Israel most likely should have disappeared, having gone into captivity and never to be seen on the earth again, because that's usually what happens to a nation when it's taken into bondage and conquered in war. Three times God brought that nation back and made it a state again. The last time it happened was in the year 1948. Now, another interesting thing to note is that there are three festivals at which the Jews are required to uh, congregate at Jerusalem three times a year. The first festival is Passover, which corresponds to the exodus of being brought out to, of Egypt. That's where that holiday came from. The second festival is the Feast of Weeks, which corresponds to the 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel. And the third and final festival is the festival of the ingathering, which happens in the fall. It's very distant from the first two festivals, which occur more towards the spring. That festival, the ingathering, is a festival that's celebrated not only for Jews, but also for Gentiles, as they would all be called to Sukkot, or the time when they would dwell in booths and tents in the land of Israel in Jerusalem. So here we have an amazing imagery foreshadowing the final coming ingathering to the nation of Israel when Messiah will return. Now, although Israel became a state again in 1948, it wasn't fully born until technically the year 1949, because during the year 1948, it was in war. That war was settled in 1949 when the peace treaties were signed. From 1949 until the year 2026, we will have 77 years for the nation of Israel. Jacob, from which we get the name Israel, because Jacob's name was turned into Israel in the Bible by God, Jacob got his bride at age 77. So the question is, will Christ return for his bride when Israel turns 77? That would be the year 2026, which would be seven years prior to the anniversary, the 2000th year anniversary of the crucifixion of Christ, and the 6,000th year anniversary of the creation of the world. So therefore what we can see is that there is a seven year time frame from when Jesus may return for his bride to when the millennium starts. This may be the seven year tribulation. Now all of this could possibly be incorrect obviously, but I think the preponderance of the evidence suggests that something is going to happen very soon in terms of biblical prophecy. There's a lot that has to go on in the world. For example, in order for there to be an antichrist to rule a world kingdom, there must first be a world kingdom. So there might be some wars, famines, upheavals, but all of these would be the beginning of sorrows. The reality is we are approaching very close to the end of the world, but it's not truly the end of the world. It's really just a transition into the reign of Christ, the thousand years of peace. But knowing that the time is so short, the most important thing that I want you to get from this video is you need to get right with God because Jesus is coming back very, very soon.